Does anyone remember that episode of A Pup Named Scooby-Doo where the gang busts a drug cartel that was using mind-controlled dolphins to smuggle cocaine? Or what about that time Garfield did an homage to the Plague Dogs? Hold on to that cat good and tight now, Larry. Easy now, fella. Easy there. The reason I bring these up is threefold. One, they're attention-grabbing. Two, it's funny. And three, both bear some similarities to the book I'm going to be discussing today, in that it features a bizarre blend of mature and family-friendly content, most people probably never knew it existed, and the few who did are likely going, oh yeah, that. That's right, the book we'll be delving into today is One for Sorrow, Two for Joy, by Clive Woodall. And I realize the obscurity portion of my joke might be damaged by the fact that I already devoted almost 15 minutes to discussing this book in my Xenofiction video, but, as J.R.R. Tolkien once said, such is life. He probably said something like that. I mean, it's a fairly common phrase. Also, those Scooby-Doo and Garfield episodes were real, by the way. Look them up. Anyway, roll the intro. One for Sorrow, Two for Joy is a mythic novel about birds from various species joining forces to resist the rule of a group of genocidal, fascist corvids. Magpies, ravens, crows, rooks, jays, jackdaws, and the like. But as interesting as a story with that premise could turn out, to be completely honest, it is the single worst xenofiction book I've ever read. And I've read a lot of xenofiction. However, on the bright side, I think this book makes for an excellent learning example. And given that I know some of you out there are interested in writing your own xenofiction stories, hopefully this critical breakdown can be of help as you develop and refine your own writing. And Mr. Woodall, in the highly unlikely event that you end up seeing this, uh, nothing personal? My goal here isn't to mock or deride, but to constructively critique and have some fun while doing so. But this book sold hundreds of thousands of copies and Disney even bought the film rights, so I'm sure he'll be fine. With that being said, as interesting as the plot, characterization, and world building are in this book, the first thing we need to talk about is prose, a subject that I find a lot of confusion about nowadays among aspiring writers. Simply put, prose is written or spoken language in its ordinary, non-metered form. So this sentence right here, this is prose. Plot, characters, setting, themes, and messaging, those are all what is written, while prose is how it's written. And I feel that all too often, Inexperienced writers don't place enough value on the latter, when in my view, how you write is just as important as what you write. Here, I'll read a passage from near the beginning of this book, one that I feel fairly represents Woodall's prose overall, and then break down the problems. Now that the time for parting had come, Kirik felt sad to be leaving the old owl. He had very quickly grown fond of Tomar, and had cherished the companionship and the comfort it gave, after such a long period of terror. Kirik felt daunted by what lay ahead of him, and, not for the last time in his journeying, began to consider himself inadequate to the task. But he knew that, once started, the adventure itself would carry him on, and would give him little time for such doubts. Survival itself would be enough to think about. His journey to find Dariel would be long and arduous, through unfamiliar territory, and Kirik wondered what sort of reception he would get at the end of it all. Now, there are a number of elements that contribute to strong prose, among them word choice, brevity, rhythm, sentence variation, and perhaps most importantly, the concept of show, don't tell. Word choice involves balancing the use of evocative imagery without being too flowery or overly descriptive, and avoiding unnecessary repetition. Brevity is keeping your writing as concise as it must be to convey what you aim to, sentences being no longer or shorter than they need to be. Rhythm involves the way a sentence flows as it is read, and variation involves the construction of sentences in relation to one another. Lastly, show don't tell is a little more complex, but as to the basics, it is generally better to show the reader something with your prose than to tell it to them, something I'll discuss in more depth in a moment. But first, I feel some comparisons will be helpful. One of my favorite lines of all time comes from the opening of Henrietta Branford's Fire, Bed, and Bone, a novel about a dog struggling to survive during a peasant's revolt in medieval England. The wolves came down to the farm last night and spoke to me of freedom. I honestly think this sentence is perfect. Imbued with meaning and imagery, but not too overbearing or flowery, using exactly as many words as it needs to in order to get its point across, 
fluid rather than clunky, and beautifully evocative. The dog recounts being awoken as she slept within the boundaries of her master's farm by the howling of a pack of wolves, who tempt her to abandon her domestic life and join them in the wild. This motif of being enticed by a dangerous freedom not only ties into the literal plot, which centers around a peasant's revolt and the resulting brutal crackdown by the nobility, but to the novel's broader themes of dependence versus self-sufficiency. For comparison, here is how I would rewrite this sentence to be more average. Last night, when I was sleeping in the farmhouse, I heard wolves howling, asking me to join them in the wild. Now this sentence isn't bad, but it certainly isn't good. It's longer than it needs to be, contains unnecessary pauses in between differing clauses that could have been consolidated, bluntly tells things to the audience that were shown more poetically in the original, and lacks the almost musical rhythm of Branford's initial sentence's construction. If I wanted to make this sentence truly bad while not outright breaking any grammar rules, I'd rewrite it as, When I was sleeping in the farmhouse last night, a pack of wolves came to the farm and howled questioningly into the night, asking me to come into the wilderness and join them. This sentence is way too long and clunky, repeats words and ideas, uses unnecessary descriptors that tell in addition to or in spite of showing, and just spells out the subtext of the scene. Naturally, not every piece of writing needs to have prose as strong as Branford's. A book with a gripping story or well-developed characters can get by just fine with only decent prose. And indeed, some of my personal favorite novels have prose that falls into the range of serviceable to good. But to ignore the importance of prose entirely is to metaphorically shoot your writing in the foot before it ever gets a chance to run. A book with a strong story but mediocre prose, such as Ken Follett's The Pillars of the Earth, was a slog for me to get through even as I wanted to be invested in the underlying narrative, while a book with excellent prose but a mediocre story, like the second entry of Patrick Rothfuss's likely-to-never-conclude Name of the Wind trilogy, was thoroughly enjoyable to read in the moment, but left me feeling empty and even somewhat cheated after completion. And to any aspiring writers out there, don't worry if you're struggling to wrap your head around what constitutes good prose. It's something you gradually learn with experience, both in terms of writing and reading, so don't be frustrated if the skill for either crafting or recognizing it doesn't come to you overnight. And of course, there is still room for a wide variety of styles, many of which come down to a matter of personal preference. Also, it should be noted that for every quote-unquote rule of prose, there will almost inevitably be an exception, where breaking that rule would result in stronger writing, but I think it's best to master the rules before attempting to toy with them. The most important takeaway here is that prose is the lifeblood on which your story thrives in the mind of the reader, and therefore to underestimate its value is to ignore the very soul of the medium in which a writer works. Visual media like movies have numerous non-writing elements, including score, sound design, cinematography, shot composition, lighting, color palette, effects work, costumes, set design, and acting, any and all of which can help elevate, or distract from, the quality of the writing, or each other. But in literature, everything is conveyed to the audience through prose. As author, you play the role of actor, cinematographer, composer, and production designer all at once. With that in mind, let's return to that excerpt from One for Sorrow. Here we come to the subject of show, don't tell, often touted as the most crucial rule of writing. In some ways, it is deceptively simple. Instead of telling your audience something, show it to them. Don't tell us a character is angry, show us their brow furrowing, their face contorting, their eyes blazing. Don't tell us that a character is acting suspicious, show us them shooting furtive glances, fidgeting, unable to make eye contact, sticking to the shadows. Or, to get more complex, don't tell us two characters dueled with swords, show us the slashes, thrusts, and parries, the skill and determination, the stress and tension and danger. Violations of this rule are incredibly commonplace in amateur writing, especially among those heavily influenced by visual media, many of whom seem to view literary writing as simply a substitute for making movies rather than an entirely different craft. And even many experienced writers do what I call show, then tell. For example, I recently started reading the Wheel of Time series, and I'm liking it so far, but one of my biggest complaints about Robert Jordan's prose is that he will often show us a character feeling an emotion, and then spell it out for us in the next sentence. And while this isn't as bad as telling instead of showing, 
it still weakens the prose and bluntly exposits to the audience that which they should have been able to infer. Unfortunately, One for Sorrow takes a unique approach to violating the rule of show-don't-tell in that it expands its telling to significant portions of the plot, rather than restricting it to the realm of characters' emotions, as is commonplace. This book doesn't violate the rule so much as douse it in gasoline, set it on fire, and dance on the ashes. Just look at that excerpt. In it, Woodall tells us that Kirik is sad to be leaving rather than showing it, tells us that he has become friends with Tomar the Owl after kind of showing it, You already said that. tells us the specific reasoning for this rather than letting the audience infer it, tells us that Kirik is afraid of the coming journey and that he feels inadequate, tells us that he is working up the courage to persevere, tells us that he knows the journey will be difficult, Dude, you already said that, don't you remember? and tells us that he, a robin, is worried about meeting an eagle, as he should be, which we will come back to. Individually, any one of these instances of telling might have been forgiven if they were surrounded by strong showing, but this is an entire paragraph of nothing but telling that recaps not only the previous chapters, but summarizes the coming ones. To fix each of these, you could have Kirik acting mournful by refusing to talk or sing when he normally would, and sticking close to the owl, especially when darkness falls, show him asking Tomar for reassurance, and have Tomar try to cheer him up to demonstrate their friendship and give the owl more characterization, have Kirik remember a comparison between his dead family and Tomar, or admire Tomar's strength and resolve in the face of danger, or compassion to a member of a smaller species that large, powerful birds often overlook, or even prey on, show Kirik trying to bargain with himself about not needing to embark on the journey, or have him ask Tomar if he can truly be relied upon, or if there is anyone else who would be better suited to the task, and you could then have Tomar reassure him, reinforcing both their friendship and his wise mentor status. The owl could provide advice about the dangers Kirik might face on the journey, instead of just having the author tell us it would be dangerous, and Kirik could ask questions about Dariel the Eagle that show his nervousness, rather than just telling us he wondered what sort of reception he would get at the end of it all. For another example, Take this passage where Traska, the villain's chief enforcer, interrogates a grebe when trying to track down the hero. At that moment, the four other magpies descended on Anise from all sides, attacking her savagely and causing her grievous injuries to the head and neck. Blood streamed from the lacerations and, although Anise got in a few telling blows herself, she was soon cowed. At a sharp signal from Traska, the other magpies fell back, and he peered angrily down at the stricken grebe. I don't like repeating myself, he shouted in her face. Where did the robin go? Anise glanced around desperately, but could see the hopelessness of her position. She would have to tell. And so, Traska learnt of Kirik's visit to Tanglewood, and to Tomar, the owl. The magpie nodded thoughtfully. He had learnt much about Tomar from Slykin, and knew that the owl would be a worthy adversary. But he soon shook off any premonition of troubles ahead, as he looked at the abject bird beforehand. Thank you, said Traska wickedly. That wasn't too painful now, was it? Then he turned to the other magpies. Kill her, he said, and flew off. It's the same as before. Excessive telling instead of showing, combined with overall clunky prose. At that moment, the four other magpies descended on Anise from all sides, attacking her savagely and causing her grievous injuries to the head and neck. Blood streamed from the lacerations. This doesn't read like a tense action scene, it reads like a police report. To demonstrate one of many ways this could be improved, here is how I would write the passage. Four other magpies launched from the brush, descending upon Anise and slicing with beak and claw. One slashed the soft down of her neck, while another's talons grappled for her eyes. As blood streamed over the grebe's face, she struck out with her own beak, plunging it into one of her assailants and tasting warm iron. But as the wounded magpie withdrew, the others redoubled their efforts. Then, just when Anise thought she would collapse from the pain, her black-feathered foes retreated, leaving only Traska before her. The lone magpie peered down at her with a wicked gleam in his eye. I don't like... Repeating myself, he hissed. Where did the robin go? Anise glanced around, hoping desperately to spot some form of escape or assistance, only for her heart to sink. He, the, the robin, 
The magpie's black, beady eyes burned with cold malice. The grebe shuddered. The robin was looking for Tomar, the owl. He lives in Tanglewood. That's... that's all I know. Please. As the grebe pleaded, Traska thought on her words. Tomar. Even Slyken feared the old owl. Who would have thought that a lone robin could prove to be so much trouble? A whimper from Anise drew his attention back to the pathetic bird groveling at his feet. Ah, see? Traska crooned. That wasn't so painful, now was it? Turning his back on her, he unfurled his wings and readied himself for flight, then glanced to the others. Kill her. See, this way, we are shown the attack on Anise, her fighting back, Traska's interrogation, Anise's realization of her hopeless situation and reluctant yielding of info, Traska's concerns about Kirik and Tomar, and his mercilessness. To make a second comparison with Henrietta Branford's prose, let's look to the opening of another of her novels, White Wolf. A wolf needs water that splashes all summer and turns to ice when the sun goes red. A wolf needs sun on his pelt in the springtime and snow on his snout in the fall. A wolf needs live food with warm blood and running feet. A wolf needs a pack. All I had was a cage. Just beautiful. But if we were to write this in Woodall's style, it would read something like, I lay in a cage, remembering fondly and with great sadness the time when I was free. I used to be able to run happily in the open, splashing through the streams in the summer, and my paws would crunch on ice in the winter. I recalled enjoying the warmth of the sun heating my pelt in the spring, and shivered with delight at the thought of snow falling in autumn. Then my stomach rumbled with hunger, and I wished desperately for live prey that I could chase down, because it had been so long since I had eaten properly. The food my human owners gave me could never hope to compare with wild flesh. I missed my pack sorely, and hated being stuck inside of a cage. See how that just sucks the life out of the writing? Throughout this video, I'll continue to point out instances of particularly egregious telling instead of showing, and use comparisons to other works to illustrate my point, but I think I've laid enough groundwork here to discuss the other aspects of this wonderful little novel. Now onto the story itself, beginning right from the, well, beginning. For all my criticisms of this book, I have to say that the opening paragraph is fine. Kirik sat high in the ash tree concealed from open view by the foliage, and relatively safe. It was a glorious spring morning, and he felt an almost uncontrollable urge to sing out, to celebrate the passing of a long and miserable winter. But Kirik knew the dangers of such folly. The days of birdsong were long past. His very life depended on his silence. I'd trim some of these sentences to make them a little less clunky, but all in all this is perfectly serviceable. A mostly solid opening sentence, the establishment of an ominous tone, and a clear sense that the main character is in danger. However, from here, the prose and structure take a nosedive in quality. In the next two paragraphs, we get a bland, telling-heavy recap of the previous few months, during which Kirik watched as magpies slaughtered the other birds in the area, including his own mate, Selene. Kirik had been hunted for several months now. In the early days, the magpies weren't so persistent. They were naturally lazy and, as carrion eaters, could always find an easy meal. Things were different now, somehow. The latest hunt had been concerted, orchestrated, and deadly. It had already claimed the life of Kirik's mate, Selene. She had been worn down by the chase. Exhausted and terrified, she had finally broken cover. The end was swift and bloody. Kirik had watched in horror, helpless, as his mate was torn apart. Now, two weeks later, the grief had subsided. A robin is by nature an optimistic bird, but the memory would never leave him. As far as he knew, Kirik was the only robin left in birddom. Certainly, in the months of his pursuit, he had seen no other, save Selene, nor any sign of their existence. The destruction of his species was all but complete. Indeed, many other familiar varieties of bird, sparrow, thrush, blackbird, were gone, living on only in the memory. Magpies were dominant throughout the land. For now, let's ignore the world-building problems present and just focus on the framing of this opening. There is nothing wrong with opening in media res, or in the middle of a story, as opposed to ab ovo, or from the beginning. 
The former can help hook the audience with action at the risk of lacking context for and investment in what is happening, while the latter can allow for gradual, easily digestible introductions to a cast, story, or world at the cost of feeling slow or boring. But for some reason, Woodall chose the worst of both approaches. He throws us into what is technically an opening action scene, with Kirik fleeing for his life from a pair of murderous magpies, but then immediately pauses to recap the events of the prior months, draining the scene of any tension or energy. If we are truly to believe that Kirik is in mortal danger, he should be panicked, focusing on escape, with maybe brief flashes to the death of his mate. The sentence, the end was swift and bloody, on its own, would work well as a glimpse of what had happened. But instead, we just have the events of the prior months glossed over and recapped in a dry, methodical manner, of the Corvids' growing numbers due to the prevalence of carrion, and of their gradual expansion and recent extermination campaign against other bird species. And once the action scene truly kicks off, and Kirik manages to escape, he encounters the owl Tomar at the end of chapter 1, and then spends half of chapter 2 recounting his life story right up to the opening we just read. Then from here, the book just moves on, so we get absolutely no characterization for Selene or the rest of Kirik's family or community beyond what Woodall tells us directly of them through the Robin's memories. And not only that, we get no sense of what Kirik's life was like before the Corvid invasion, and thereby no context for what has been lost that the heroes will spend half of this book fighting to restore. We don't even get a shred of information about the Robin's culture in this mythic xenofiction book something I'll return to extensively later. Just listen to this passage of Kirik recounting what happened to his family only a dozen or so pages in. My parents were among the last to be caught, Kirik continued. Their courage and resourcefulness had managed to protect us all for many months, whilst the Holocaust was happening all around us. But finally they were trapped and killed by a large band of magpies. They fought magnificently, but had no chance against so many. We had been with them, but had departed just before the attack. We had flown only a short distance, and we could clearly hear the awful commotion. Celine and I both knew instantly what had happened, and we both realized that there was nothing that we could do to save them. It was the blackest day of my life. Obviously, books with an epic scale can't afford to show the audience everything. Some scenes will occur off-screen, and be relayed to the reader through another character's exposition later on. In Watership Down, for instance, we don't actually see the destruction of Sandalford Warren directly, but have it recounted in depth later by Captain Holly, one of a handful of survivors. But this right here is one of the most important events in our main character's life, the inciting incident that drives him into contact with his quest giver, and it's just read off like a middle school book report. Imagine if instead of showing us the scene of Fiverr encountering the message board and uttering his cryptic prophecy, Richard Adams instead just had Hazel exposit what happened to the others. Hazel told his friends that he and his brother Fiverr, the runt of their litter, were out in the field last evening when he and Fiverr came across a strange post smelling of men. Shortly afterward, Fiverr had had one of his fits and started rambling about how the Warren was going to be destroyed. Or what if Tolkien had just skipped the scene of the Council of Elrond, only to have Frodo later say, representatives from the different races and kingdoms sat around arguing for a while, until I said that I would take the ring to Mordor, and then they all agreed. This kind of recapping is fine if we actually see the events firsthand, and have them recounted later for the sake of other characters learning about them, as occurs with Pippin informing Denethor of Boromir's death, but having such important events rendered as little more than bullet points leaves the book feeling less like an actual novel and more like an outline or summary. Given that the BBC's director of drama and entertainment himself claimed this book was an epic tale in the tradition of Watership Down and the Lord of the Rings, That's a filthy lie! I feel it's fair to take this comparison further. The entire structure of this book's opening is like if Tolkien had begun the Lord of the Rings in the middle of the Nazgul pursuit, had the hobbits escape within two pages, and then included a handful of paragraphs where their backstory was just read off, after which the four show up at Rivendell. Imagine how much of the rich world-building and characterization, as well as tension and pacing, would have been lost. Simply put, Woodall gives us the skeleton of a story without any meat. Where's the meat? Even Watership Down, which has its inciting incident in the first chapter and quickly launches into its epic quest, still gives its story grounding with the cultural world-building present throughout that chapter. We get to see what life is like for the rabbits of Sandalford Warren and how their society is organized. 
to come to know both Hazel and Fiverr through their actions and relationship, and to witness the power disparities that end up driving others to flee with the two. And Watership Down continues to build upon the depth of its characters and the world they inhabit over the course of the entire novel, something One for Sorrow hardly ever even attempts. I want to impress upon people that there is no one right way to structure an opening. You could start this book with Kirik fleeing for his life, and then provide context in flashbacks over the course of his journey, or jump back after the opening to before his community was destroyed and let the story move forward from there. Alternatively, you could begin the story from the time of Kirik's hatching, or from when he first met his mate, or shortly before the magpies murdered his family and friends. And if you went one of these routes, you could even preserve the tension of an in media res opening by featuring a prologue from the perspective of a different character who is pursued, and perhaps even killed, before jumping to Kirik's perspective, similar to what George R.R. R. Martin did with A Game of Thrones. To choose one approach, I would begin this book with Kirik and his mate out foraging near their home, when they spot another bird fleeing, which pauses long enough to warn them of the magpie threat. Kirik and Selene could then relay the cryptic warning to the other birds of their community, only to be ignored. And maybe one of them could even be skeptical, giving us a little bit of mild conflict between the two, only to later witness a bird being chased down and killed by a pair of magpies a few days later. You could even have the magpies spot Kirik and give chase, only for the robin to be saved by a passing owl, something that would inspire him to seek their help later on. In the meantime, we could also get a sense of the robin's culture, with Woodall establishing customs of birdsong and ritual bathing, mating displays, territorial disputes, governance, religious beliefs, mythical stories about heroes, and so on, to make this world feel alive and unique in the way that Richard Adams did with his rabbit societies. There could be growing tension and disagreement among the birds about what, if anything, to do regarding the magpies, or if they even pose a threat to songbirds at all. The territorial, fractured nature of the community in the spring when real-life European robins are less gregarious and more combative, could leave them disorganized and unprepared for the magpie's arrival several chapters in, after these characters and their culture have been well-established, in order to make the audience care when most of them are slaughtered. Kirik and Selene could then flee, only for the latter to be killed, at which point our main character seeks the help of the owl he was inadvertently saved by earlier. And to further provide characterization for our protagonist, you could have Kirik attempt to distract the magpies and fail, demonstrating his bravery, or you could even have him panic and flee, abandoning his mate in a moment of weakness and thereby giving him further reason to be so desperate to set things right and absolve himself of his guilt. Structuring the opening this way would show the audience what is at stake, rather than just recapping the losses in bullet point form, and would help invest readers in the mythic avian world making it feel like a living, breathing setting rather than the crudely constructed stage for a work of fiction. It would also allow ample opportunity for the author to show us who Kirik is as a character instead of merely telling us that he is brave and determined, to imbue his grief with real weight, and to show us the cruelty of the villains rather than just giving us a Wikipedia article on their war crimes. As I mentioned when initially covering this book back in my Xenofiction video, there's a reason Tolkien spent so much time in the Shire before having the hobbits venture forth into the dangerous world beyond. That way, not only do we get to thoroughly know our characters in a mundane environment before seeing them be tested, but we understand what it is they are fighting to protect, and why they care, which makes them feel like real people we the audience can connect with and root for. Around this time in the book, we get more information on the villains, both in the form of cartoonishly over-the-top grimdark scenes involving them, and through Tomar the Owl's exposition dumps. Tomar, by the way, is the leader of the Council of Owls, which governs all birds on the entire continent, and this book is supposed to take place in something resembling our world, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The two primary antagonists in this book are Slykin, who is basically Bird Hitler, and Traska, his right-hand magpie something of a Himmler meets Heydrich meets Ted Bundy type. Slykin doesn't really do much in the book. He's more of a background character and an object of Traska's conflicted adoration and revilement, while Traska himself fills the role of the primary antagonist who actually goes out and pursues the heroes. So sort of an Ozai and Zuko dynamic, except, you know, not good. Don't patronize me! Now, to say that this novel's villains are cartoonishly evil is insulting to the mustache-twirling dick-dastardlies of the world. 
Heck, even Who Framed Roger Rabbit's Judge Doom was less cliché and over the top. Just listen to the backstory of Slykin himself. Slykin was a magpie, unremarkable in appearance from others of his species. He was, in fact, rather on the small side, and had limped from an early age. But Slykin was imbued with intelligence, cunning, and above all, evil. From birth, he had demonstrated a terrible capacity for treachery, killing his siblings on the nest within hours of hatching. Abandoned by his distraught parents, he had eaten his dead brothers and sisters to stay alive. Then, as a young adult, he had avenged himself on his mother and father by arranging for them to be murdered in a most sickening fashion and having their heads brought to him in his lair. So uncivilized. Of course, we don't actually see any of this, it's just told to us as bland exposition. And the characterization of his chief henchman Traska is just as corny and told rather than shown. His every thought and action, from that time on, had been the epitome of evil. He admitted this to himself, and reveled in the fact. Cruelty had become his trademark, and it had been natural, therefore, that, as a juvenile, he should have come under the influence of Slykin. Traska thought back to their time together with a sensual pleasure. By the gods, there is a psychopath on the loose! I swear, this book is so edgy you practically need gloves to handle it safely. I'm not saying there aren't people in the world who truly enjoy inflicting suffering on others simply for its own sake, but there comes a point in a narrative when the level of evil just becomes laughable. And it's especially jarring when juxtaposed against the novel's childishly simplistic prose and character work. Hence my prior comment about that Pup Named Scooby-Doo episode with the crack dolphins. I mean, the main villain of this book is literally born evil, murdering his infant siblings within a day of hatching and then cannibalizing their corpses. <laughs> Something that is probably becoming clear by now is that this book is edgy. I'm talking YouTube circa 2016 edgy. I'm talking Xbox Live Modern Warfare 2 pregame lobby chat edgy. I'm talking a spiky red and black hedgehog wielding a submachine gun and blasting three days grace edgy. But I feel I should clarify just what I mean by that, and where I draw the line between something being quote unquote edgy and dark, brutal, or mature. The film Downfall chronicles the last days of Nazi Germany from the inside, and it is one of the most gripping, fascinating, and disturbing movies I have ever seen. You get deep insight into the brutal, amoral, strict consequentialist, and ultimately nihilistic philosophy of the Nazis, sometimes straight from the Fuhrer himself. You see children armed with rifles and sent to their deaths by people determined to prop up a regime they know will collapse in a matter of days at most while die-hard ideologues poison their own sons and daughters rather than allow them to survive in a world they cannot rule. You watch ordinary people who have chosen to go along with evil because doing so was easier than resisting it, who only now realize the true depths of their failure. And you see people who have orchestrated that evil from the very beginning, knowing exactly where it would lead. And accounting for the occasional dramatic flair of cinema, it's all real. There's a scene near the end of the movie, after Hitler commits suicide, where Josef Goebbels, his propaganda minister and one of the most fanatically devoted Nazis, stands watch over the funeral pyre of the man he has dedicated his very soul to. As the Fuhrer's corpse burns amidst the war-torn, rubble-strewn cityscape of Berlin, the night lit by oil fires and punctuated by gunshots and artillery barrages, the camera lingers on Goebbels, the shadows cutting sharply across his gaunt, angular face, the flickering light bathing him in hellish, fiery orange as he looks on with lifeless, sunken eyes before giving a final salute. And in that moment, you can almost see how empty and skeletal he is, how his humanity has been drained from him in service to this evil cause, a cause he defiantly chooses to cling to even as he stares into the flames that await him and his countrymen. That is how you handle dark subject matter maturely. And I know the Big H and his goose-stepping goons seem to come up in, like, every other video of mine at this point, but... Unfortunately, when you're talking about modern history, the worst parts of human nature, or just evil in general, they do kind of loom large. Also, the villain of this book is basically Bird Hitler, so comparisons are inevitably going to be drawn. <laughs> to move to the realm of fiction, 
let's look at Tywin Lannister from A Song of Ice and Fire. Tywin is arguably the most evil person in the entire series, almost certainly one of the top five at least, which is saying something in those books. He is a brutal despot who sees non-nobles as little more than cattle, someone who views the slaughter of hundreds of innocent peasants as a logical response to an insult to his family's honor, and believes any means to be justified in preserving or expanding his family's power. He thinks nothing of ordering his own servants to be tortured for days on end for making a joke about him, and uses mass murder and rape as war tactics. He doesn't even really care about his own children as much more than extensions of himself. But all of this evil serves a narrative and thematic point. Tywin represents the feudal system at its absolute worst, and A Song of Ice and Fire is a series deeply concerned about the nature of power, and the dangers of consolidating it in the hands of a small number of people. To paraphrase a recurring observation from the series, when the powerful fight, it is often the weak who suffer most, a truth illustrated quite forcefully in the monstrous character and actions of Tywin Lannister. Even something like Ramsay Bolton's sickening treatment of Theon Greyjoy exists to throw back in the audience's faces their desire for Theon to suffer horribly for his betrayal of the Starks. Though admittedly the show often got pretty edgy here. Just saying, Game of Thrones started getting bad at the end of season 4. While well, Danny kind of forgot about... Don't at me. Stop that! Silly! Now I'm not claiming villains need to be complex. Just look at Avatar The Last Airbender. Fire Lord Ozai is a very one-dimensional villain. Dude wants to rule the world, simple as. He continues the imperialistic war for global domination that his family and nation have been waging for a century, has no qualms about exterminating other races because he sees his own as superior, and both physically and emotionally abuses his own children. He's evil with a capital E and three exclamation points. But even so, his evil is still believable. He isn't bathing in blood or screaming like a maniac in every scene he's in. In fact, he's usually calm and collected, projecting an imposing air of confidence and authority. As a result, when he does get angry, it's scary. It means something. And even then, he still retains some composure right up until his ultimate defeat at the hands of Aang. Spoilers, by the way. Ozai orders horribly cruel acts, and does them himself, even to his own son. But he doesn't torture his servants just for the fun of it, or light puppies on fire in the palace whenever he gets bored. Heck, even Azula doesn't go that far, and she's a grade-A certified psychopath by the finale. I'm sorry it has to end this way, brother. No, you're not. To wrap up this little sub-discussion, in my view, what distinguishes the maturely dark from the merely edgy is the purpose for which the writer employs something. If it's done simply for shock value, or solely to make the characters or audience hate a villain, if it overly simplifies complex real-world subject matter instead of aiming to illustrate truths about the darkest aspects of human nature and existence as a whole, I call it edgy. And that isn't to say that edgy is inherently bad, just don't expect me to take it seriously. If I were trying to fix this story's central plot, I would A, make it much smaller scale. Instead of a continent-wide genocide that would completely disrupt the ecology of the world, and surely arouse human interest, Slykin's dominion would encompass only a few hundred square miles, enough to make the story feel grand while retaining believability. B. Tone down the evil of the Corvids. They can still be Nazis, but they don't need to be devouring baby animals or ripping their own lackeys' eyes out in every scene. Goodness. And C. Give Slykin more of a motivation beyond, lol, I like making others suffer. Why is he targeting songbirds when he doesn't really compete with them for habitat space or food? Magpies already are the quote-unquote dominant bird species of most of the areas in which they live, harassing even raptors with relative impunity, so a classic case of Lebensraum doesn't really make much sense here. Maybe he resents the favorable treatment that humans give songbirds while his species are viewed as pests. Or if you want to lean into the fantasy aspect of this book, Maybe include a prophecy about a songbird who will pose a catastrophic danger to his people, leading him into a spiral of paranoia as he attempts to preemptively eliminate the greatest threat to his rule, something vaguely similar to what Fire Lord Sozin did to the airbenders in Avatar. I'll admit I'm generally not a big fan of prophecies and chosen ones, but I'm just spitballing here. And it'd be nice to have something more to go on in terms of motivation than the suffering of others is fun. With horrific violence out of the way, Let's jump to the opposite end of the spectrum and talk about romance, shall we? On page 84, 
Kirik is flying to the next quest marker when he spots a female Robin, and then immediately gets shot out of the air by a random kid. Which is an incredible shot, but who the heck shoots Robins? Anyway, Kirik awakens to find himself being tended to by the female Robin, named Portia, and just as quickly falls madly in love with her. Like, after two or three pages, the author is already describing them as deeply in love. It's just, boom, soulmates. And of course, it's mostly told to us. Admittedly, romance in xenofiction is a bit of a complicated topic, and one that isn't always handled so, shall we say, gracefully. But the general trend is that with more realist xenofiction, romance will often be very rushed, and in many cases can hardly even be described as romance. In The Fox and the Hound, for instance, Daniel Mannix makes no pretenses to any kind of anthropomorphized romance between Todd and his various mates. They are simply wild animals pairing off in the way wild animals do. And this makes sense. Certain realist works lean a little more into anthropomorphized conceptions of romance, such as White Fang's relationship with Kali, but for the most part there isn't a whole lot to do if you're writing about real animals. But in mythic xenofiction, with its personalized characters and human-style societies, authors have a lot more room for exploring genuine romance between their animal characters. Hunter's Moon and A Black Fox Running, two of my favorite xenofiction novels, both contain love stories at the core of their narratives, featuring relationships that are developed over time between fully realized characters. But even Watership Down and its sequel's subtle background romance between Fiverr and Vilthril has more meat to it than the love story of One for Sorrow. And this points to a broader problem with Woodall's characterization as a whole, one that largely stems from his incessant need to tell rather than show. As a result, his characters are hardly given any actual character. We are told that Tomar is wise, that Kirik is brave, that Portia is determined and Mickey is helpful, but we rarely actually see any of who they are as characters. To once again compare to Watership Down, the character work of which mostly hovers around the level of pretty good in my view, Hazel is a fully realized character. He cares deeply about his brother, takes responsibility for those under his command, attempts to keep them focused on their objective, and is willing to risk his own well-being, and even life, for the good of his community. But at the same time, he also gets flustered and lashes out at his brother when Fiverr's strangeness becomes particularly inconvenient, selectively omits information and uses reverse psychology to manipulate his followers into doing what he wants, and takes unnecessary risks that put others in danger out of a desire to prove himself as worthy of leadership. He's good, but not purely 100% good. Hazel has depth to him, and isn't defined by one trait. But if you ask me to describe Kirik, or Tomar, or Portia, I wouldn't know what to say beyond good, kind, and brave. They feel like cardboard cutouts taken from first drafts of an outline, yet another thing that makes this seem like a story intended for very young children. Even Woundwort, Watership Down's villain, has depth to him beneath the cruel tyrannical surface. After witnessing the death of his mother at the hands of humans, and having survived an outbreak of myxomatosis, a fungal infection used by humans to eradicate rabbit colonies, he becomes obsessed with hiding from man, to the point of organizing his warren into a brutal police state where every aspect of life is managed to avoid discovery. In a case of the ends justifying the means and prioritizing the greater good over individual good, Woundwort becomes concerned with the survival of all rabbits while completely ignoring what that means for the lives of individual rabbits. But this book's villains? Uh, they like making others suffer. A lot. And that's it. Just look at this quote from One for Sorrow's sequel, Seven for a Secret. Traska rubbed his wingtips together in anticipation. What pleasures he would take in watching his three enemies die. Senseless murder. There's nothing like it, he thought smiling wickedly. Stop it. Get some help. Oh boy. And as we delve further into the details of this book's plot and world building, we now come to the topic of suspension of disbelief, which is closely related to another aspect of writing, verisimilitude. Simply put, suspension of disbelief is the willingness of the audience to accept speculative elements, anything that is not strictly realistic, for the sake of investment in a work of fiction. Verisimilitude is the other side of that same coin. People often substitute this term with realism, but what they really mean is the appearance of reality within the confines of a constructed setting. To return to Avatar The Last Airbender, we as audience members know that bending, 
the telekinetic manipulation of classical elements, is not real. Heck, these aren't even true elements. Fire is a chemical reaction, water is a molecule, and earth and air are mixtures. But the show remains consistent in its portrayal of the magic system. We the audience understand how bending works because it is shown to us with a high degree of verisimilitude. So when Zuko takes a martial arts stance, we know what he is capable of. And when Toph, who is blind and uses vibrations in the earth to sense things in lieu of sight, ends up utilizing this ability to detect fragments of unrefined earth in metal in order to bend said metal, this new development is still believable. Verisimilitude is often thought of as only applying to world-building elements, such as magic systems, but it is also crucial in character behavior and story progression. Have someone act significantly out of character for no good reason, or introduce plot elements that don't logically follow or require excessive contrivance in order to facilitate the story, and you damage verisimilitude, and thereby risk your audience's suspension of disbelief. Zuko goes from a fairly cliché villain to a complex anti-hero to a genuinely redeemed hero over the course of three seasons, but this development is gradual and internally consistent, with important experiences throughout his life leading him to change as a person over time. If he just turned good in Episode 5 and started helping the heroes, or the Fire Nation surrendered on the cusp of victory in Season 2, or Katara started earthbending on the day of Black Sun, these would damage the show's verisimilitude, and as a result would likely harm audiences' suspension of disbelief. I say likely because it's important to note that verisimilitude exists in the work itself, while suspension of disbelief exists in the mind of the audience member. I've known people who could not enjoy any 2D animation because to them, it's all just drawings. And I've known others who could watch blatant contradictions in character work, plot progression, and world building with no damage to their investment. Somehow Palpatine returned. But as much as I disagreed with these standpoints, and was willing to try to convince those who held them otherwise, at the end of the day, if someone feels that way, that's that. The point I'm getting at here is that no matter how strongly you attempt to maintain verisimilitude in your work, there is always the possibility that including any speculative elements will prevent some people from becoming invested. For instance, one friend of mine couldn't get into Watership Down because it featured a society of talking rabbits, which he felt was too strange a mixture of realism and fantasy, while he had no problem with the wind in the willows. However, Richard Adams still made immense efforts to maintain verisimilitude in his work, which helps those who are willing to suspend disbelief at the initial premise of a society of talking rabbits. The inverse is likewise true. No matter how poorly a writer maintains verisimilitude, some people will still be able to remain invested and suspend their disbelief. But with all that being said, let's talk about One for Sorrow's approach to these intertwined concepts. This book already suffers from the frustrating pairing of its incredibly simplistic characterization and tell-don't-show writing style, both of which make it seem like it's intended for very young children, a demographic that both struggles to pick up on nuance and make inferences and also has a much greater threshold for maintaining suspension of disbelief. But the graphic violence present throughout the novel, and the fact that a significant subplot begins with a brutal rape that is described in detail, leaves me wondering who this book is even meant for. Given the subject matter, I have to assume it's made for older audiences, just made incompetently. So let's lay out the problems. One of the first things readers will notice, aside from everything being told rather than shown, is that Woodall frequently uses very human phrases in his character's dialogue and internal monologues, such as the die has been cast, an ace up my sleeve, a page from my book, etc. And has the birds of this story behave in very unbird-like ways, including hugging, laughing, smiling, steepling their feathers like fingers, crying actual tears, and even wiping those tears away with their wingtips all of which severely undermines the idea that we are reading a story about birds. Contrast this with Watership Down, where Richard Adams intentionally kept his rabbit characters from physically doing anything their real-life counterparts couldn't, with the limited and highly intentional exception of the unnaturally behaving rabbits of Cowslip's Warren. Next, as I touched on earlier, is that the villain's evil is cranked up to a level of absurdity that would make most denizens of the 40k universe cry foul. Nearly every single scene with the magpies has them mutilating and murdering other living beings simply for their own amusement. Traska usually needs no more reason to torture his own henchmen beyond being mildly frustrated or bored, which makes me wonder how this grand magpie empire hasn't collapsed under its own weight, 
when all it would take is one quick move by one or two birds worried about being murdered for no reason to silence the few lunatics running the show. It's not just evil, it's incompetent evil. Unbelievably incompetent evil. Just think about it. If you torture and kill your own lackeys for no reason on a regular basis, pretty soon your followers are going to start to question why they even follow you. You'll end up with a revolt on your hands in no time. Also, let's embark on a brief tangent to talk about species stereotypes. Yet another complication in the whole, who is this book even made for debate. Woodall goes all in on classical stereotypes for different species. The owls are wise and benevolent, the eagles majestic and powerful, songbirds are beautiful and optimistic, rabbits are nervous and gregarious, and corvids are evil, evil, evil. The seagulls are even portrayed as somewhat pirate-themed, a touch I'll admit I kind of appreciated. Shame the author didn't do anything with it. But while I suppose this classical approach could have worked if, well, everything else was done properly, I find it extremely frustrating for just how simplistic and misleading it is. Contrary to appearances, I am not an ornithologist. The taxonomical family I'm most knowledgeable on and interested in is actually Conidae, but I do like birds, and I find it very disappointing that Woodall apparently did only the bare minimum research into the subjects he was writing about, when one of the key appeals of xenofiction is getting to experience the world through the eyes of different species, and to imagine how their own societies might differ from ours. Even a cursory glance at Wikipedia would have told him that his peace-loving, friendly European robins are actually viciously territorial. Up to 10% of their deaths in the spring and summer occur at the hands of other robins, while in reality most corvids have quite a high degree of social empathy for members of their own species. And crows in particular, despite what this author seems to think, are not stupid. As a matter of fact, they're one of the smartest species on the planet. Majestic eagles often poach kills and rob the nests of other birds, and raptors of all kinds frequently prey on songbirds, something larger species of owl also do. So sorry, Kirik. And this isn't unique to One for Sorrow, but I am so sick of the ecologically ignorant portrayal of scavengers as lazy and nefarious. In reality, the consumption of carrion is not only a vital part of the nutrient and energy cycles of ecosystems, but it helps control outbreaks of disease. Just because death makes us uncomfortable doesn't mean it's unnatural for corvids, vultures, coyotes, or hyenas to eat the dead. Moving on, this book presents magpies as not only vicious hunters of other birds, even though they are omnivorous scavengers, primarily consuming carrion, insects, small mammals, nestlings, eggs, seeds, and fruits and berries, but as the dominant species of corvid, when in reality crows, and especially ravens, are much stronger and just as intelligent and organized, if not more so. Then we have the problem of scale. As I alluded to earlier, the massive scope of the Corvid's genocide severely impacts the believability of the story, as one of the very few elements of cultural worldbuilding present in the novel states that because mankind is always monitoring the environment for anything out of place, all birds do their best to avoid drawing the attention of humanity. But by the start of the book, the entire continent of birddom a name I think is self-evidently goofy, has nearly been depopulated of all bird species except corvids, with a handful of isolated stragglers surviving in their shadow, and a few communities of raptors and seagulls living on the fringes of the continent. To even remove only passerines would almost certainly cause a total collapse of the ecosystem, and if we're being completely honest here, it would probably also cause a mass die-off of corvids due to disease and starvation, rendering the villain's plans self-defeating. So why haven't humans noticed? They should be shooting magpies out of the sky left, right, and center. But what little glimpses we get of human society show them to be completely oblivious. The big takeaway here for any aspiring xenofiction writers is that you should be careful to balance the speculative elements of your work with biological realities in order to maintain maximum audience investment. And above all, please actually research the species you are writing about. Obviously it's okay to deviate from reality and take creative liberties when writing fiction, but do so with care and purpose. Now for the actual story. The central plot of this book involves Kirik's journey to the different corners of the continent of birddom, where he attempts to rally different species, eagles, falcons, and seabirds, to his cause. As always, the vast majority of this potentially epic quest is written in a terrible tell-don't-show style like so. Kirik's second journey was almost fatally delayed when he became seriously ill, less than halfway to his destination. 
The infection was virulent and immediate, affecting his breathing and making flight impossible. He first realized that something was wrong after a short stop for food and water. On taking to the air once more, he felt leaden-winged and struggled to gain any height. His vision swam and pain stabbed across his chest. Kirik bravely tried to ignore the discomfort, but soon realized that he could not go on. Why do you write this in terrible prose? On the surface, this could make for an interesting section of the book. While flying on his own, Kirik falls ill and is forced to hide and recuperate. He could use his knowledge to scavenge for herbs to make himself better, be forced to evade magpie patrols who are looking for him as he attempts to make it to a water source, have to try to find allies among the local wildlife in order to avoid starving or find shelter, or any number of other scenarios. This could be an entire chapter in and of itself, a major part of Kirik's life, something that forces him to come to terms with the danger he is placing himself in, or makes him learn a valuable lesson. But instead, he gets sick and then recovers over the course of the next two and a half paragraphs, with everything, as always, spelled out to us in bullet point form. And that's it. If Tolkien had written The Lord of the Rings like this, the Nazgul chase that occurs when the hobbits leave the Shire would have read, Then the hobbits began to flee across the countryside, hoping to make it to the rendezvous with Gandalf, the mighty wizard, at the Prancing Pony Inn in Bree. At one point in the journey, Frodo thought he sensed something further down the path, and told the others to hide in the brush. Moments later, a terrifying rider in black trotted down the road on a horse with black fur and smoldering red eyes. Frodo felt the ring calling to him, but thankfully his friends helped him resist its tempting lure, and they were able to escape when Merry tossed a sack into the woods to distract their pursuer. The four hobbits then ran on blindly through the woods as darkness fell, and eventually the riders located their trail, resulting in an exciting chase that culminated when the group reached the Brandywine River. Here, the hobbits leapt onto the abandoned ferry, and the Nazgul were forced to detour because they could not cross running water. This allowed the hobbits to make it safely to Bree, where they settled into the Prancing Pony Inn. Unfortunately, Gandalf was not present, and so the four resolved to wait, eating and drinking to pass the time laughing merrily and sharing stories. Frodo, meanwhile, noticed a mysterious figure watching them from the shadows. I think I've made my point. Basically, Kirik just shows up at each of the quest markers, talks to an NPC, explains how bad things are with the magpies, and they agree to help. The eagles and falcons are won over right away, while the seagulls refuse to pledge their support, but then just show up at the final battle anyway because the villains decided to brutally kill the seagull leader's daughter, in case you didn't get the memo that the magpies are evil. Those are enemy birds! Oh yeah, and while going to the eagles, when Kirik and his new mate end up surrounded by magpies in the woods, there's this subplot where a random rabbit helps them escape through his warren's tunnels. I don't know why the rabbit even cares to help them, and it really strains my suspension of disbelief that these ordinary birds would willingly venture deep underground, something that should go against virtually all of their instincts, but I especially love how when the robins mention their friendship with the eagles, the rabbit smirks and says, Obviously, the eagles do not eat robins. I get that you're trying to be cheeky, but they do. They will literally kill songbirds mid-flight. In fact, real-life raptors are more antagonistic to passerines than corvids are. And corvids will actually harass raptors to the inadvertent benefit of nearby prey species. But this book presents eagles as the noble protectors of other bird life against the depredations of the evil magpies, and it drives the biologist in me crazy. And speaking of suspension of disbelief being obliterated, in the meantime, Slyken captures the Council of Owls and begins planning a grand feast to celebrate himself being crowned King of All Birddom, ordering his followers to begin collecting carcasses from all over the countryside surrounding his home nest. But unbeknownst to him, Tomar the Owl finds a stash of poison in a shed, and makes a deal with all insects on the entire continent for birds to stop eating them forever if they help with his plan. And what plan is that? Why, using that very limited amount of poison to contaminate as many carcasses as they can find in order to turn Slykin's coronation into a sort of reverse red wedding. I have several questions. How are you going to use that tiny amount of poison from one vial on hundreds of carcasses to kill thousands of magpies? How come the insects aren't killed by drenching themselves in the poison to carry it to the carcasses? How are the magpies not going to recognize that the carcasses have been poisoned? After all, and I can't stress this enough, they are an extremely intelligent species. 
We're talking about a genus of birds that have learned to read traffic lights so that they can use the tires of passing cars to crack nuts open. How do none of the magpies give in to their hunger and sneak a piece of the poisoned meat before the feast is scheduled to begin? Throughout the entirety of this book, we are constantly shown that the magpies have very little discipline and are incredibly lazy, opportunistic, and selfish. So it is nigh miraculous that none of them ate early, died, and revealed that the meat was poisoned. How are mammals and birds even communicating with insects at all? I know this book has almost zero world building, and I understand that the speculative element of animal languages inherently requires some suspension of disbelief, but I don't buy that a mole is able to effectively communicate with creatures so vastly different to itself, especially not to the level of striking a complex deal. Later on in this very book, we are told that even birds from the neighboring continent of Wingland are unable to communicate with the birds of Birddom. And even if they could communicate, how are insects able to understand the concept of a treaty in the first place? Is literally every living being in this world functioning at a human-level intellect? Why would you make a deal with all insect species when you could just make a deal with one of them? Or heck, just make a deal with a single colony of ants, or a few local colonies at most. There's only one vial of poison, so you don't need that many insects. And this way, you don't need to deprive your entire taxonomic class of a vital food source and guarantee a catastrophic destabilization of the ecosystem in which you live. And lastly, about that deal. Tomar essentially decides to doom the entire world in order to defeat the magpies. This wise old owl, who has benevolently presided over the birds of his continent for years, doesn't seem to realize the apocalyptic implications of what he is doing. If all birds stopped eating insects, those insects would proliferate out of control and destroy all vegetation on the planet within months, if not days. And that's not even mentioning how many countless birds will starve to death, so good luck enforcing that rule. This is literally a doomsday scenario that he creates just to win a war. It's like if the Allies decided that to defeat the Nazis, we'd blow up the moon or poison the entirety of the oceans or something. Also, I feel the need to point out that the translator between Tomar and the Bugs is a star-nosed mole, a species native to North America, while this story takes place in Europe, but honestly, we've got bigger fish to fry here. My investment in this book was already minimal by this point, and I had long since stopped suspending my disbelief. But this insect poison deal plot point eviscerated any hope this book had of retaining even a shred of verisimilitude. How could someone who even remotely understands ecology and we're talking like middle school level food web understanding, think that this plan makes any sense is beyond me. Funnily enough, this is something that actually gets addressed in the sequel, and spoiler alert, it gets worse. But we'll save that for later. As it stands, it's a much larger echo of when the eagles agree to give up hunting rabbits entirely because one rabbit helped their robin friends one time. That was still ridiculous, but at least the ridiculousness was contained. Anyway, after securing help from across birddom, we come to the final battle, where a bunch of magpies get poisoned, the eagles, falcons, and seagulls show up, everyone has a big fight, the captive owls are freed, and Slykin is killed. It's not like the author put a ton of effort into describing it, so hey, why should I? At this point in the book, you may be thinking, huh, that's weird. The villain was just killed, and we had our big battle, but we're only at page 160 of a 300-page book. And that is when we get our twist. Kirik, our plucky little one-dimensional hero, gets the bizarre notion that his mate is in danger, rushes underground for some reason to save her, gets ambushed by Traska, and dies. What a twist! And that leads into part two, titled Two for Joy, which takes place a year later, after Kirik and Portia's children have been born. I should clarify that choosing to have the main character and villain both be killed halfway through the book is not bad on paper. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Had it been executed well, we could have gotten an interesting shift to a focus on other characters, and an exploration of the society having to rebuild in the aftermath of Slykin's reign. Additionally, I don't think choosing to break the book up in this manner was inherently a problem, as I personally am far more accepting than some when it comes to unorthodox pacing and structure. So long as I'm sufficiently invested in your characters or world, or find your prose engaging enough, I can forgive unusual decisions with regards to narrative structure, or long stretches where little happens plot-wise. As it stands, the problems, as with so much else in this book, are found in the execution. 
Part 2 of this book serves as little more than an extended epilogue, and features the same abysmal tell-don't-show prose, superficial characterization, and bland, nuanceless conflict as the first half. After murdering Kirik, Traska flees and tries to rebuild his power in the corners of the continent, taking control of a group of hooded crows, which the author mistakenly believes are stupid. Meanwhile, Tomar and Portia, along with the latter two's children Marion and Olivia, attempt to rebuild birddom. Portia and her friend Mickey end up traveling to the neighboring continent of Wingland to convince the birds there to return to birddom. They fail utterly, but then in the last few pages they see a cloud of birds coming north because devastating continent-wide fires have forced them to flee. That seems awfully convenient. So hooray, we end this nightmare of lazy writing tropes with their king, the deus ex machina. But what makes the second half of this book truly bizarre is the direction it decides to go with regarding Traska. And to understand that, we need to go back. Here we come to the part of the book I really wish the author had chosen to leave on the drawing board, because he handles it just about as well as he does everything else. Brace yourselves, because this book is about to get even more uncomfortable. In part one, after being thwarted yet again by our plucky heroes, a seething Traska singles out a random female magpie and brutally rapes her. Bizarrely enough, this is one of the only scenes where the author bothers to show in addition to telling, and the assault and its aftermath are described in graphic detail. This is the point where any arguments about this book being for kids were incinerated. Now, while I can understand the aversion that some people have to horrific subject matter even being covered at all, I personally don't think that anything should be strictly off-limits when it comes to fiction. After all, if we start laying blanket rules about what content is not allowed in the arts simply by virtue of the subject matter being appalling or abhorrent, we'd be ridding ourselves of some of the greatest films, shows, books, paintings, plays, songs, and so on. Just look at Schindler's List, or A Song of Ice and Fire, or Goya's The Disasters of War. That being said, handling horrific subject matter requires a certain maturity and competence on the part of the artist both of which are severely lacking here. We end up following Traska's victim, the young female magpie Katya, as she is consumed with a desire for revenge, vengeance being literally her sole motivation in life from that point on. An uncomfortable takeaway, to say the least. In yet another instance of that patented Woodall brand subtlety, she even names her son Venja, raising him to hate Traska and training the young magpie to kill his evil father. Theoretically, this kind of plot could result in some excellent storytelling about the nature of trauma, grief, revenge, and hatred. But as it stands, it's basically just more juvenile, edgy, shock value window dressing with delusional pretensions of Shakespearean grandeur. You didn't need to post that. Fast forward to part two. The majority of the way through the second half of this book, Traska chances upon Katya once again, fails to recognize her, and falls madly in love with his old victim, to the point of even acting abashed when she chides him for being so forward. What? This part is especially bewildering, because up until this point, Traska has been nothing but a one-dimensional, capital-E evil, cardboard cutout of a villain. His sole motivation has been to make others suffer as much as possible. The only thing even remotely approaching an exception to this came right after he raped Katya, when he experienced a moment of shame. And even then, it just led to him becoming even more hateful within like two sentences. But now, 244 pages into a 312-page book, Traska suddenly spawns part of a conscience because he simply sees someone he finds attractive. It's not like he gets to know her first and their connection nurtures something good within him. It's just, wow, she's cute, and bam, he regrows a part of his soul. This is like if the Lord of the Rings suddenly had Sauron develop a love interest in the middle of Return of the King. And the funny thing is that aside from feeling love for this one character, Traska is still cartoonishly evil in every other way. Just look at this monologue that he gives right before the climax, mocking two children by boasting of how he killed their father and is planning to do the same to them, right in front of Katya. So many questions, Traska exclaimed contemptuously, and pecked the young robin on the side of her head. Let's take them one at a time, shall we? Why am I doing this? Because I can, that's why. Because there is no bird in the kingdom that can stop me. You have done nothing to me. That is very true. But it is your misfortune to be the progeny of a bird who did his very best to thwart me. 
Unfortunately for him, his best wasn't good enough. In the book's climax, Katya reveals her identity to Traska, at which point we get this top-tier dialogue. Your soul is in hell, Traska, intoned Tomar into the silence. You are damned beyond redemption. Anyway, Traska tries to kill the young Robins he kidnapped, Katya attacks him, and his crow henchmen tear her to shreds as he watches in horror. Then Venja shows up, the two duel, and Traska kills him, making the entire subplot of the son training to defeat him and working to track him down basically a complete waste of time. And to add insult to anticlimactic injury, Traska then gets shot by some random humans who are out looking for his son, who injured a little girl earlier, which was also unnecessarily graphic. Just be thankful I glossed over it. And something something happily ever after. Whew, alright. With the plot out of the way, it's time we talked about this author's handling of mythology. Or more accurately, the utter lack of it. When writing mythic xenofiction, one of the most interesting aspects involves envisioning what different species' cultures might look like, and then introducing said cultures to the audience. So for the tenth time, let's go back to the one that started it all, Watership Down. In his magnificent debut, Richard Adams gave us information on how rabbit societies are structured and governed in a sort of caste system, with a chief ruling, his Ausla comprising the inner core of supporters, a sort of police force, military, honor guard, and advisory council all rolled into one, ordinary rabbits making up the main bulk of the population, and outskirters, who are either too young or weak to have established themselves in the main warren, living on the fringes when the population gets too large, his rabbits have a language that we the audience see bits and pieces of, though most woodland creatures are capable of communicating with each other on a rudimentary basis through a sort of rural mammalian pigeon. The rabbits have a complex series of myths and folklore, revering the folk hero El Herrera, the prince with a thousand enemies, as both the father and shining ideal of their people. The black rabbit of Inlay serves as their angel of death, escorting the souls of the deceased to the mysterious Inlay, the land of moonrise, while Frith, the benevolent, omnipotent, life-giving sun deity, oversees all of creation. Adam's rabbits have a well-developed cycle of stories involving El Herrera's various exploits, and the rabbit prince himself is a complex character in his own right, possessing flaws and making mistakes. But most importantly, this mythic figure sheds light on what Adam's rabbits value, not bravery or strength, but low, underhanded cunning, as rabbits themselves must rely on wit and speed, rather than brute force, to survive in the wild. Richard Adams manages to cleverly envision what a society of herbivorous animals near the bottom of the food chain might look like, how they would justify their place in existence through their religion and myths, and develop different values from the ones most human cultures prize. Or let's look at Brian Carter's A Black Fox Running, a dazzling and highly overlooked work of xenofiction that I will definitely be covering in the coming months. In this story, the foxes of Carter's rural English setting view death at the hands of the hunt to be honorable, what they term the good death, as they understand that death of some form is inevitable, and believe succumbing to the hunt to be preferable to a slow, ignoble death from old age, disease, or starvation. Carter's foxes abide by a set of principles that are almost absurdist and nihilistic, partially influenced by Buddhist philosophy, though most individuals rarely bother with such higher concepts focusing merely on survival, and leaving contemplation of the mysteries of life to a select few wizened sages. Or what about Gary Kilworth's Hunter's Moon, where foxes practice complex scenting rituals throughout their travels, and pass down stories of great heroes? Or Gabriel King's The Wild Roads duology, where cats utilize magical ley lines to traverse the world as a select group of their number fight an ancient enemy? Or the Wolves of Time duology, where wolves from across Europe herald a mystic summons to the center of the continent as the world of man tears itself apart. Or David Clement Davies' Firebringer, where herds of Scottish red deer form rigid societies and seers hand down an ancient prophecy. So what does Clive Woodall give us in terms of mythology? Very, very little. Almost nothing, in fact. We are told that the Council of Owls has ruled birddom for generations, and we get a very brief story about its founder, an owl named Preta, who united birddom when it was threatened by mankind's ascension long ago. And that's about it. And even that story is just blandly told over the course of about a page and a half. Of all the author's decisions that I have spent the last hour or so criticizing, this is arguably the most baffling, 
because while I can attribute many of this book's myriad failings to the incompetence and inexperience of its writer, I see no good reason for him to have ignored one of the key appeals of writing a mythic xenofiction novel. Just look at this passage. Tomar and the young robins had been the first to leave, as the old owl wished to avoid a lot of goodbyes, which might remind Olivia and Marion of their mother's departure. He had flown slowly, flapping his huge wings with great deliberation and keeping his pace to theirs. And, while they flew, he had talked. Tomar had told them about the founding of birddom, and of the first great owl. Time passed quickly as he spoke, and the two children were too enthralled by his words to feel tired from their journey. They peppered his tales with questions, limited only by their occasional lack of breath from flying so far and asking so much. Why, why on earth would you introduce mythology only to say he told them stories and they asked him questions? I already made this point in my prior Xenofiction video, but can you imagine if Richard Adams had written Watership Down this way, instead of actually giving us the stories of Ella Herrera? Then Hazel and his friends gathered together, and Dandelion told a story of the great rabbit hero, Ella Herrera, and everyone was very inspired by his trickery and filled with hope and courage. For goodness sake, this is a book about birds, a class filled with species that have highly complex social structures, employ distinct musical vocalization, and engage in unique mating and bathing rituals. You're working with material bursting at the seams with potential for a fascinating mythologized cultural setting, and you just don't even try. How do the different communities of birds govern themselves, aside from everyone just apparently respecting the vaguely defined rule of a single group of 12 owls at the center of the continent? What about fighting between species, or even within species? Just narrowing our focus down to robins, do they have religious beliefs? Intricacies of language or communication? What role does birdsong play in their culture? What about any mating or bathing rituals? Or other customs? What about holidays, especially considering northern-dwelling European robins are migratory? Do they have important folklore or heroic cultural figures, which could show us what they value as a species? Or tales of important events? We don't get any of it. And it's such a shame. I mean, it wouldn't have been written well in this book anyway, but it could have been something, at least. To anyone out there who's interested in writing your own mythic xenofiction, please, please don't ignore this part of the writing process. Not only is it just plain fun to develop and explore the hypothetical cultures of different species, it is vital to making the setting of your story interesting and believable. And lastly, that brings us to this book's sequel. That's right, there's more. But I'll be brief, since the well of writing lessons is starting to run dry by now, and thinking about these books this much is honestly kind of making my head hurt. The sequel, titled Seven for a Secret, is set two years after the great battle that occurred in the middle of One for Sorrow, Two for Joy. Birddom faces a new challenge in the form of way too many freaking bugs. Gee, who could have seen that coming? Tomar, the great owl, refuses to rescind his order banning all birds from eating any insect, which has caused mass starvation among birds, ecological upheaval as mankind turns to increasingly desperate tactics to eradicate the massive hordes of insects, and an upswell of discontent because our heroic owl is enforcing his insect-eating ban with summary execution of birds that break the rule. And this internal rule of law proved harsh but effective. Summary execution was the norm for any bird found transgressing for the sake of live food in its belly. I had to read that passage twice because I honestly thought I was mistaken the first time around. That's right, Tomar, the wise old owl, the benevolent leader of birddom, is straight up murdering birds for consuming their natural prey and helping maintain balance in their ecosystem. And it should be remembered that a significant number of these birds immigrated to this land and weren't even a part of his deal in the first place. This is outrageous. It's unfair. So Tomar is a villain now, but unfortunately the author doesn't seem to recognize this, and views the ridiculous insect-bird deal thing as completely valid and justified. But we've already gone over why that doesn't make a lick of sense, so I'll just move right on. Basically, there's this owl named Engar who opposes the insect-eating ban, and his stance is, understandably, becoming increasingly popular. For a moment, just a moment, I thought, oh my goodness, are we about to get morally nuanced conflict? Uh, no. But of course not, because this is the sequel to One for Sorrow, Two for Joy. So instead, Engar turns out to be a plant by Traska, who somehow survived, no we don't get any explanation, and the author specifically describes him as despising the owls of the council, 
and Tomar in particular, for their honor, justice, tradition, and goodness. Wow, what a compelling villain. All so much empty rhetoric and self-importance. He despised them all, Tomar most of all. Engar could barely think of the old owl who clung on so determinedly to the leadership of the council without anger welling up inside of him. Tomar represented honor and justice, tradition and goodness. Engar spat, as if trying to clear an irritating feather from the back of his throat. Tomar had to go. When your villain literally spends his internal monologues ruminating on how much he hates goodness, and you're not writing a parody, you're probably doing something wrong. Also, I shouldn't have to point out that tradition is not inherently a good thing, but whatever. As it so happens, Engar is just as malicious and sadistic as Traska, and the two connive to take over the Council of Owls by promising to rescind the insect-eating ban. Tomar fears that the insects will rise up and slaughter all birds if this happens, because the author apparently thinks that insects are just a monolithic block, and not actually an incredibly diverse collection of 30 million different species that prey on and compete with each other. Just ignore it. But the other owls somehow fail to recognize how blatantly manipulative and power-hungry Angar is. Though, in fairness, maybe they're just tired of being starved and executed. Anyway, the young owl eventually takes over as leader of the council, then starts appointing magpies to it, only to get backstabbed by Traska shortly thereafter. A move that no one saw coming. You fell victim to one of the classic blunders! I can't believe you've done this. And it's funny how the author tries to give Engar's story this semi-tragic end, but he was evil to the core. We're even specifically shown that he enjoyed torturing innocent birds just as much as Traska did. The only reason he's sad before he dies is because he lost. He wasn't some well-intentioned extremist or tragic anti-hero. He was just a sociopath who happened to be as stupid as he was sadistic. Oh yeah, and there's this subplot where mankind wants to evacuate the continent or country, it's never really clear, so that they can use some magnetic superweapon that will eradicate all living things to kill the insects, and then Tomar remembers some vague prophecy and Kirik's kids go meet a wolf who knows about bird paradise somehow, and then the rapture happens. What? I'm not even kidding. This book ends with the bird rapture. A swarm of ghostly wolves sweeps across the continent and devours all birds, and the good ones go to Avia, which is basically bird heaven, while the bad ones just die horribly. Then moments later, the humans activate their sci-fi superweapon and everything else in birddom dies, but the heroes don't care because they get to reunite in heaven while the world's ecosystem inevitably collapses because of everyone's gross incompetence. What a great lesson for dealing with totalitarianism and environmental collapse. Just let the world burn and trust in a vague magic prophecy to escape. And at this point, I was so checked out that I couldn't begin to imagine what the author was hoping to accomplish or say, but I don't really care because it was also pretty hilarious. So that is one for sorrow, two for joy, as well as its sequel, seven for a secret. They're really bad. If you're still here, congrats for making it this far. I hope you learned something. I know I sure did. At least, I think. Man, this was exhausting. Anyway, if you want to write xenofiction, or really anything, just please don't do it like this. Oh yeah, Disney bought the rights to this, by the way. Is it wrong that I kind of hope they go through with an animated adaptation?
Your soul is in hell, Tresca, intoned Tomar into the silence. <laughs> you are da- <laughs> You are damned beyond redemption. <laughs> How do you write something like that? Oh my gosh, I love this book. Dawn saw an unappealing sight in the rafters of the derelict warehouse. Two carcasses hung pathetically from one of the beams. They had been stripped of their beautiful black and white plumage, and empty sockets remained, where once greed had glittered in their eyes. They had also been disemboweled. Watching this sick shit.